Hi, everybody. My name is Miles Ward. I'm the global head of solutions for Google's cloud platform. And I'm super excited to present to you today about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been operating application infrastructure for over a decade today. I uh, built a startup and operated its systems and have worked through hundreds of businesses as they translate their infrastructure and their operations from a private environment or from other facilities into public cloud. So what I'm hoping to do is walk you through in a relatively informal way. I'm going to talk as plainly as I can about what I've seen work, what I've seen be functional, what, what kinds of gotchas there are as you come onto Google Cloud, what sorts of things to expect so that we can create an opportunity for you to be able to capture as much value as possible from our infrastructure. Uh, and to start with that, I'm going to need to ask the developers to get out. Anybody a developer in the room? Hardcore developers, good. They are all in the other meetings talking about rewriting everything. Uh, it's, it's, leave them that part of the work. I, I like software development. I think it's an, uh, an interesting challenge. It's nowhere near as fun as keeping things alive, keeping things, delivering value over time. Building the first time is, it's frankly kind of the sort of fun part, right? This is the real working part where we're building a system that can survive the test of users, the test of data, the test of time. So I expect that for many of you, this new move to cloud, the concept of public cloud as an infrastructure creates a bunch of new opportunity. And I can tell you that the future is very bright there. I'd also you know, potentially present some challenges. And I want to talk through those challenges and make sure that we're being as clear as we can around what you can expect as you come to public cloud. So as I understand it, and as I'm talking to customers every day, what I see in practice is a system that's born out of the history of technology in practice at every business everywhere. So maybe you rent a chunk of a co-location facility, or you've got a data center or two. Right? You have redundancy and availability provided by more than one virtual machine or maybe more than one physical host, but not threes or tens or twenties. You have applications that are installed often manually. Sometimes you've got some automation that's been built in there that's, that's managing the way that applications get deployed, either in virtual environments or in bare metal environments. You know, and then you've also got a bunch of weird stuff tucked around under the corners. You've got a desktop under the water cooler. You've got a machine that sits underneath Billy's back build box that's where all the really fun stuff happens. Like the complexity of these systems is born out of their accretive construction as they're built over time. You know, you probably have at least one or two Hadoops. I'll tell you a funny bit. Uh, my startup, we experimented with Hadoop when it was 0. .00001, and we went to a conference, uh, and we were calling it Hadoop for like three months because we had no idea how it is that you talk about that. It's a clear item. Listen for anybody who mispronounces the names of very complicated technical products. It means they learned about it by reading. You want those people on your team. They read the docs. <laughs> so uh, we also are seeing lots of businesses use a whole panoply of different storage systems. I think some of the highest complexity sits in filers and databases of a zillion varieties and uh, application connectivity between those databases. That can be some of the stuff that's some of the most complicated in non-dynamic public cloud environments. You know, and I think. Most of the assembly of these kinds of systems, again, is happening at the same pace as business. You have a quarterly set of goals. You have a relatively short planning window. You have a view to where it is that your business is trying to go for a specific product launch or a specific regional launch or uh, just trying to be able to do the next update of physical infrastructure. And that means that because you're making this sort of relatively short planning horizon, you take locally optimal choices. You say, well, you know, if we need one more box, let's buy one more box. Instead of taking a minute to step back and look at the overall systems and be able to evaluate for what's most efficient in, in writ large. Our, our environment, we, we hear from customers quite a lot, is that there's this very big opportunity in, in the middle of a movement, in the middle of a transition from one kind of technology to another, to clean up some of the bad choices of the past. We see people try to use it as an investment in reduction in technical debt or operations debt. Try to take the opportunity. When we do that cloud thing, we're going to do it right. We're going to get serious about automation. We're going to get knee deep into this whole new world of stuff and make sure that everything works properly. Right? And that, that movement 
uh, opportunity is one that, frankly, flies totally in the face of all of the ITIL best practices that you've been told that says, change just one thing at a time, right? Move all the stuff, don't screw with it, make sure that it works in that way, and then start, of start removing individual building blocks and pieces. So we want to we wanna help you think through which are the kinds of places where a little bit of change as you move makes sense, will reduce your risk, will make it so that these systems operate more reliably, and which changes maybe you should hold off on, make it so that you move in a way that's easier to digest and understand. So we hear all the time that, oh, oh man, oh man, once the sort of magical, mystical systems in the cloud take over, everything, operations will be so incredibly easy that we will never have to do anything. The serverless thing just means that there are no operators in the world. I will give you a hint, and I don't even have to make it up. It's great. I get to quote the chairman of Google, and he says, the number one limiting resource for businesses is our technical skills, right? He just said it on stage like 20 minutes ago. You are all the technical people that he's talking about. None of your businesses are in a situation where all of a sudden they find themselves with this incredible opportunity to get rid of their best, brightest, and most talented people in order to save a dollar or two. In reality, most companies are dying to find more talented, aggressive, innovative folks. And I can think of no better way for you to give evidence that you are in that category of operators than by taking on the challenge of this more complicated, more technically challenging move to public cloud. That can kind of sound like a sort of a crappy sales pitch, but I also watch it happen. Right? I go into companies, and over the course of months, a couple of their folks stand up and say, yeah, I got to figure out how this thing works. And somebody gets up, I can see them in the console clacking away at things. And then a couple months later, that person's performance is seen as, as great. And I, I see new job titles on business cards. And everything starts to move in a way that I think most employees want. So I also want to make sure that you recognize we, we are on the hook with you. Right? I, I think it's super easy to be able to quote the chairman. It makes my job really nice. He listed this whole litany of teams at Google that are committed to our customers' success. That's engineers on the Google side that are here to help you. And I'll, I'll restate the list because I think it's super useful to understand. We have, at the very beginning of your interaction with us, customer engineers. Those are folks that are dedicated resources for working with our customers to ensure that you understand our platform, that you know what building blocks are available, that you have access to all of our resources for onboarding education. And as you have clear questions about how our systems are built, they're the first point of contact. As they want and you want a little executive air cover, you have a boss or their boss or somebody who's saying, I don't know about this public cloud thing. That seems kind of... We have folks for that. That's called the office of the CTO. So if you want to interact with folks from us that were CTOs or CIOs at other businesses that have been there and done this transition before, we have full-time Google employees that will come help you with that. If both of those folks say, the problem is not the bosses. The problem is that they're trying to do something that's particularly unique and, and they have a, a pattern that we haven't heard of before. That's my team, Solutions Architecture. We'll come help ensure that what you're designing is best practice, ensuring that the operations patterns that you want to follow uh, meet the needs of your customers, and, and making sure that that's something that gets documented so that you can reuse those patterns over and over. Everything that's at cloud.google.com slash solutions is an output of that work effort. We've also got folks in professional services that can augment your staff as you build up for a big transition or migration. We have folks in customer engineering, uh, it's called customer reliability engineering, that will sit with you years after you launch to ensure that your operations practices follow the Google SRE model, follow the model for high-scale web-facing operations. So we are recommending some changes. And those changes are born out of the fact that this model is way more efficient. So I, I have seen now 30 different spreadsheets from 30 different companies just this year describing to me what their actual cost of their private environments are. I will give you a hint. None of those have the same line items. Nobody f has the same list. There's not some sort of central place where all the actual costs get written down. And most of the time, this stuff is done by departments where they inherit some of the basic infrastructure from other parts of the business. That's 
very powerful if what your business unit only has to pay for is maybe the new computers or, or the SaaS applications that you want to deploy. But for what we're watching, those externalities can be very real constraints in your ability to be nimble. So I, I work with companies all the time that grow, 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 grow until they have filled up that data center. And now they need another one. And that next one computer costs a whole lot more than the last one. And so that independence from scale, does not matter if you want a couple pieces or a whole bunch of pieces, uh, allows you to stop thinking about the power and the cooling and all of the rest of the infrastructural building blocks. How many folks have screwed around for uh, hours with routing tables in the core routing of your data center? Folks done that? Yes? Sucks. Super sucky. Right? And then you're in the middle of like trying to figure out how do I redo addressing and what's the number range we're going to use and oh, does that overlap with these other guys? And you delete all that stuff. We have a petabyte a second bisectional bandwidth already installed. At any point, you need a little more network, it's already here. Right? You want the network for another 400 machines, that's great, it's already installed. So that all of the work associated with that instrumentation moves up a layer of abstraction. And that's the change that we're recommending. Rather than you logging into the individual switch and making sure that it's configured in the way that you want, or altering the firewall on this individual firewall box, you do that logically at our service layers to ensure that the same changes that you apply are systematically applied across all of your projects, across all of your applications. That makes sure that you have the ability to sort of multiply your effort. And we think about this stuff in a lot of ways when, when I've done operations, uh, I got really frustrated that I wasn't Superman, that I couldn't stay up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and that I wasn't able to you know, move at the speed of sound from where my desk was over to the colo, and then back to my desk, and then back to the colo, and then back to the desk. I needed laser beams to be able to adjust. We think that public cloud gives operators an incredible set of new superpowers. Right? Like, I'm personally, uh, my favorite would be uh, a total independence from procurement. Right? Like, how many folks have like clear buy-in from somebody to buy the machine, you got a clear need for the machine. You got to you know exactly the spec of the machine. You got a vendor that's going to sell you the machine. You got the form all filled out for the machine. And then it'll totally be shipped here in like three weeks. But no, it's actually four weeks. And no, no, they've lost it at the dock. And it's seven weeks. <sighs> all of that stuff is just deleted when you have a provider that is buying a fifth of the computers that are manufactured. We have leftovers. I swear these. So that that extra capacity allows you to react to your stakeholders much more nimbly, right? They say, I need a build box this afternoon. And you say, how about 36 seconds from now? Because that's the TP99 launch rate on VMs today. Right? Don't even launch it for them. Forget that. It's one rest call. So put a little wrapper on it, put a snazzy green button on a web page, hand it to them, let them off to the page, smash the button, they have their own dev box. Get out of my hair. I have real work to do. Right? That kind of change in the operational model where your partnership with a couple of those developers, maybe building up a little bit of the tooling, building up a little bit of the access instrumentation, can really shave off the ununique, undifferentiated work of some of the base operations. So again, superpowers, right? The environment can get a zillion times bigger. And then when you're done with it, it can go away. It can go away perfectly. Like how many folks have spent, I spent so many hours just cleaning up network cable trash on the bottom of my cage. Just clean up, just deleting all of your stuff, just throwing out all the mess, getting rid of the cardboard boxes, getting rid of all the stuff. You don't have any of that with us. You're able to just shrink down to zero by saying, I don't like this project anymore. I'm closing it. And now it's gone. You want another one back that same way? You can use a Deployment manager template to stand up that whole infrastructure over again from scratch. You need three copies of it this afternoon. Stab, stab, stab. Deployment manager will deploy three copies of that rapidly. You also give yourself some ops superpowers around your interaction with developers. So the dev, you know, I'm 
I take sort of personal umbrage at the concept of DevOps. I've worked at places that were the inventors of the term, and uh, I've seen it sort of morph and become a different thing every other sort of afternoon. Uh, DevOps now gets just sort of stuffed into the bucket that operations is, and I think that's, that's unfair. There's a very separate practice there. Google's written quite a lot about it. We call it, on our side, SRE. And a big part of that practice is being able to not only build systems designed not to break, but enable systems that fix themselves when they're broken because they're going to break. And so a lot of the work around instrumenting for easy rollback, easy deploy and retract, A-B testing, subdivision of different patch releases into your application, all that stuff, there is quite a lot of tooling on Google Cloud to enable that. So we expect that you already have most of these building blocks, that they're not particularly new. You probably have virtual machines. You probably have some kind of clustered storage system. You probably have relational databases, NoSQL databases of some kind. How many folks have incredible nights of fun staying up super late maintaining NoSQL clusters? Yes, you love it. You have a great time. See, there were very few hands there and lots of tears in the back of the room. So those jobs are particularly painful because the applications that you're managing, while they hold the crown jewels of your business, in most cases, the real core data that powers your applications, those applications are new. They're very new. And they're built in the open, which is awesome. We are super huge supporters of open source. We've given a lot of technology, particularly for data storage and data management to the open source. But when I talk to operators, what I hear from them is I want something that is absolutely war tested. I want something that's run hundreds of times bigger than me. I want to know for certain that it operates. So you heard Eric describe Spanner. Spanner is the relational store that sits behind every Google service. It operates at hundreds of millions of operations a second in aggregate across its zillions of back-end systems. And it is globally transactionally consistent. It scales as wide as you want to go. And you don't have to mess with figuring out your sharding structure or figuring out how you're going to do re-indexes under load or load balancing between read and write levels. All that stuff's deleted. That kind of battle-tested infrastructure, Spanner as a single example, but is present across Google Cloud Platform's products. So data store is the data store that, huh, data store is the data store. Uh, data store is the system that they talked about during the keynote about Pokemon Go. That's where they're writing 50 times as many transactions as other environments, totally unnotified. It, anybody have 50 times as many computers as you currently own laying around but not using them and just sort of keeping them for fun? No. OK, cool. I was just double checking. Um, that, that availability of scaled resources is just very powerful. That said, we're hoping that not everything requires change. So it's my experience that a really substantial number of the tools, the monitoring, metering, management applications, automatic deployment, CI, CD, the kinds of applications that you've built on top of public data center, those, those are already compatible. We've built and done a lot of work in our development effort to ensure that your systems of record are already compatible with us. We've done, uh, we've done work with being able to do monitoring systems and visualization systems, Graphite, Influx, Grafana, all, all of these tools plug into our services without any kind of big pain. We have some first party stuff for this, and we think that they're good products, but Google's commitment to open ensures that we'll continue to make our applications permeable, transparent to the kinds of monitoring and metering that you want to be able to apply. And it means that a lot of the run books and the sort of basic approaches that you're using to operations management, they still work today. And this, this partnering spans uh, all of the different sort of components of the stack. We're really excited about what that allows folks to do. And, and so like another example of this stuff that's really good, how many folks have used Datadog before? Yeah? I like it. Here, Elon, stand up, turn around, wave. He's from Datadog. It works really good. So those kinds of tools, they work very powerfully in private environments, but I think they also get a couple superpowers by being present in public cloud. And our, our value proposition to you is to be able to use the same panes of glass, the same views that you're used to seeing in your own environments on our environment. And that, that adds a lot of value 
you know, from what I've seen in, in reducing the risk of that transition, making it so that it's just more straightforward to see a comparison of the two moving. And so that's like probably the very first operations best practice that I'd describe is because our systems are inexpensive, because we give them to you for free for $300 for the first several months, because we're, we're in the middle of making them cheaper every day, you really should be able to take at least some component of your application and have it run on us in a way that seems familiar to you. Not just, I can turn it on, but turn it on and hang the full spectrum of your current management and operations tooling around that application. I will, I will tell you, this was my experience. Um, individual single computers are very reliable building blocks today. They do, they do things like you'd expect. Anytime you move past the behavior of a piece of software on a single computer, and you have more than one computer, all of a sudden those building blocks become sort of substantially unreliable and crappy. So I'd be really interested, as, and, and you can feel free to reach out to me personally after this talk, or at any point in the future, this is a big part of our commitment to being available to our customers. I'd be really interested to hear, as you do those tests, what's the reliability, the consistency of bandwidth, the consistency of network latency, the consistency of access to disk and disk performance, the consistency of access to remote storage systems in comparison to the private environments that you deploy? Right? Even environments that are designed very purpose-built, very single-tenant, very monolithic around an individual application, Google has so radically over-provisioned some of these basic resources that they can feel really, really reliable and really, really consistent in comparison to even your environments that are private and dedicated, and certainly in comparison to other public cloud environments. That's at least what we measure today. So, what are those steps? How would you do that, right? Um, we, we see this happen sort of in two halves. So the first is finding stuff that's a little nasty, the brownfield, right? Isn't, isn't, maybe you're not really in the middle of like considering that the sort of core beating heart of the business. It's the, the second and third tier applications that are, uh, that are sort of more work from an operation standpoint than they probably deserve to be. Right, those kinds of applications, you can earn immediate time savings by having them run in an environment where your operations overhead is lower. So they can be a very important step in bringing applications into a public environment. You know, we think in a lot of cases that means moving your existing database software, not replatforming onto our databases. It means moving your existing choices around operating system and file system instead of replacing those with more native cloud environments. We've got partners, there's a great booth downstairs, you can take a look, Cloud Endure will help you migrate a VM with a click of a button. So if you've already got VMs in VMware or Zen or anything else, those kinds of pieces move over to us very seamlessly, very fast. The other piece, once you've sort of taken something and you have it in practice on top of us, you really have an opportunity to experiment with our more modern, more advanced tool systems, right? So take something that's running in MySQL, maybe 5.6 or 5.7 today, Unplug that and plug it into Spanner and see what the behavior differences are, right? See, observe inside of your code, like how much DML do you use? How many inserts and updates are there? Is that something that where Spanner is going to be compatible for your work or is it not going to be a fit? You know, take a look at uh, especially taking advantage of our network infrastructure. So anything behind our CDNs, behind our load balancers, behind our front ends, those have massive latency and performance improvements, particularly for web-facing, customer-facing front end applications. We have, again, this enormous network. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to take advantage of it. And you can do that even with a single application running in a single region or a single zone. You're still connected to Google's global front end. So, this is the button on the, the Cloud Endure piece. Certainly importing virtual machines is important. I don't want to underestimate the degree to which most of us in the operations field are absolutely feeling pressure from developers. I, I hear it quite a lot to move from virtual machine-based infrastructures or baking images or these other kinds of deployment modalities into container-based systems. Uh, we're the ones that built Kubernetes. We're the ones that built the Linux C group that backs all of this container technology, all of Google's infrastructure, everywhere, every application that you run, including these virtual machines, sits inside of a container. So we have a little experience operating this stuff. It really does create a very substantial performance and efficiency benefit for your applications. 
right? If this virtual machine, because it's gigabytes in size, takes seconds to load, an individual container inside of our application architecture takes milliseconds, 50, 55 milliseconds. If you want to see that in practice, this is the, I think it's the funnest demo of the whole thing. You go out to the main booth, and there's a thing that looks like one of those circus whack-a-mole hammer machines. You seen this? So it's got little holes in the table, and a little hammer, and you smash the mole. Each mole is actually a current running container inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And it's one application. It has nine copies in the container. You can't hit the moles fast enough to bring the app down. There's a little special one in the corner so you can prove yourself that, in fact, the application goes down because it kills them all. But you can't smash and slay containers quickly enough for us to not go, huh, now it's down. Huh, let's build a new one. Huh, let's boot it. Huh, let's launch it. That all happens in milliseconds, right? Like individual key presses are tens of milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds. So that, that transition operationally for lots of businesses is creating very real benefits, not only from efficiency, right? You can cram a bunch of containers onto individual machines. You can load balance between sets of containers. That's a pre-built part of Kubernetes. But it also ensures really great benefits from an availability standpoint. You have one virtual machine fail, and that's running all of your application. Well, the application has failed. But if you've got a fleet of virtual machines and your application is distributed across them in clusters, it takes milliseconds to bring back online inside intra-user event kinds of signals. It's very powerful stuff. So we also have very rich and very mature networking structure. I hear from a lot of operations folks that the number one impediment to their ability to adopt public cloud is access to the kinds of network configuration and control that they need to remain compliant with their business's best practices. You already have super clear runbooks that say you will open these ports and these protocols to these IP ranges for applications inside of these individual VLANs. Those building blocks are present on us. We call them some different things because we're maniacs about naming, because I think all nerds are maniacs about naming. It all started with writing my guy's name is Adder of Azeroth at the top of your character sheet, right? Like, it's just, we're all terrible about that stuff. So our network systems, uh, the advantage that you have is that it sort of feels like everything is behind one giant terabit a second firewall. Right? You have only one place to make these rule changes. You have only one system to, oh, that's right, never have to patch again. You, have only, you don't have to do rolling updates of new hardware additions or rolling redistributions of network structure. All that stuff is built in with us. And we have the same kinds of controls that you need, ingress, egress filtration, cross-project networking now is making it so that you can build isolated projects that can path, pass individual uh, channels of information back and forth in secured, controlled ways. We have managed VPN. We have the ability to build private interconnect to us, a thing called Google Cloud Interconnect. That allows you to route private linkages so you can take MPLS to any colo provider that's on our network edge, and we're sort of on the other side of the internet, so we're in most of the edges. It's 77 of the ISXI peering points in the world, and that's not a big number in total. There's only like about 100 of them. We're actually at the rest of those, but there aren't places where there's leftover colo space, so you've got to be able to get into those facilities. You can also um, use, use new services from us uh, that ensure that that connectivity is private. You can manage your own keys there. You have your own control over the encryption ciphers that are used. You really have a very rich platform for network control to ensure that your best practices can be reused. And our hope and our expectation is that over time we can continue to lower the barrier of entry there. We want to make it so that you can do things like copying your current network configuration and profiles and running that on us. So we have a tool in GitHub right now. If you're running in AWS, you can copy your firewall configurations and paste them on us, and they work right. No fat fingers, no accidental oopsies on the firewall rules. That kind of simplification, where we're just trying to think like operators and think about reducing the risk of implementation, reducing the challenges associated with doing this the right way, uh, that's a big focus for my team and other teams at Google as we, as, we, as we embrace these kinds of workloads. So we also really think that there's, there's just a lot of uh, routinized grunt work that goes into this kind of thing. A, a particular pain point that I've seen is being able to comply with regulatory oversight. How many folks are stoked about their next audit? Note, no hands. 
right? Audit compliance is a monster. And it's really brutal if you're the one that's sort of manually constructing all of the logs of the changes that you made, or even if you're using automation to do it, those become themselves systems of record that now you must maintain and operate and keep track of and make sure they don't crash and don't lose their data and back up their data and recover those backups because you can't trust backups if you haven't recovered them. Don't do that. So our systems are already doing all of that built in. So every functional change that you make in our infrastructure is audit logged. We have a comprehensive trail of that log. You're able to produce copies of that log on demand. They are stored in GCS storage, which does not lose objects. So you don't have to do the backup work or the maintenance work. You need that stuff shared. That's all available online right now. And it's impossible for one of your employees or one of the folks that you manage to be able to launch something that doesn't get logged. How many folks have had like that one guy stuff that one extra laptop in the corner of the back rack that makes it so everything works, but it's on nobody's spreadsheets and it's got no antivirus on it and uh, like this stuff goes terrible real fast. In cloud, you can't get in. There's no like back door. There's no like extra spot where I can stuff the weird toys that I want to play with on the weekend. So we've really made it so that this is a place where you can exert a little more control a little more oversight and management to ensure that the, your constituencies, the folks that you're managing for, uh, are following the rules. And that, for us, what we've seen is that that makes the biggest impact in these kinds of security and compliance pieces. A big part is just offloading all of the operations work associated with achieving compliance for everything below the virtual machine. Right? If we're the ones who have to go through and prove to the BC PCI DSS folks that, yep, these computers are, in point of fact, safe to process credit card transactions on. And then all you have to do is the audit controls of your application above that. That's just a much smaller surface area of management. And, this, and if all of a sudden, like, say today, you work in retail, and so you're processing transactions, but then all of a sudden one of your sales guys gets like super smart and starts to sell a part of your product into healthcare, oops, you have to be HIPAA compliant all of a sudden. Error. If you built a compliance regime and a modeling and a record system for your operational tooling that's designed around one compliance system, and then all of a sudden you have to accommodate another, that can be a huge retooling and rebuild exercise. I, I've helped companies do that. So with public cloud, you're already achieving all of the standards that we've already signed up for. So you already are PCI DSS, level three certified for the infrastructure stack. We've done that now with dozens, hundreds of businesses. You can just sort of check that off your list. You don't ever have to work on that part. And the auditors, they know, right? They've gone to other customers of ours and they go, oh, oh, oh this is the Google Cloud one? Okay, marvelous, yeah, don't worry about it. You, we, we know that they have that part handled. You don't have to re-explain it the 800th time. So that can be very powerful, can be a very big impact. So I said a bunch of good news. Public cloud sounds super great, right? You're all going to move. It's going to be awesome. Everything's going to be awesome. The reality is that it's not all done. Uh, I don't. Th right now, the sort of ratio to sales from salespeople to engineers is deeply biased on the engineering side. So there is clearly way more for us left to build, right? So what are the things that are still hard or complex? What places can you? Anticipate that you're going to have to do a little extra operations work in order to be able to accommodate the challenges of this system. First off is, remember how I said that it was like super easy to build stuff? It's super easy to build stuff, which means that you're going to build all sorts of stuff like super fast, and it's going to go out into the reaches of the interweb. There will be copies of your software that your engineers decided they wanted one more build box, but they wanted it in Singapore, and they wanted it in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, that can create very substantial sprawl. It is easy to delete stuff. We made that clear. But I think many businesses, because they're used to deleting, meaning de-racking and shoving in a chipper shredder, that all of a sudden deletions are, are to be you know, carefully done. right? Like, if I delete this, maybe somebody else's thing turns off, and oh, I don't know where the sort of isolation layers are, and oh, maybe I'll just leave that thing there. So I certainly encourage that the more work you do in programmatic management, the more work that you do in automated deployment development, um, that you match that effort with the effort to track and use our 
very clear, you have great tagging capabilities, great reporting and auditing capabilities on our side. You can certainly keep track of this stuff and be able to manage it, but it, it's an absolute place where we see customers have trouble. It's, it's also super easy to use these tools when you have like three virtual machines. You name the first one web, and you name the second one app, and you may name the third one DB, and it's like right there on the screen, like, mm, yeah, my stack is sweet. And then you have 750 VMs. And, the, and it shows the first 10, and then it's, the bottom has a little box that says, this is page one of 75. And you go, hmm, that's going to be somewhat daunting to find my little snazzy web and app and DB, right? So these interfaces are absolutely designed uh, and built around the experience of our developers and our users who are building a project for them. Right? They, ha they have to be easy to adopt. They have to be able to use uh, uh, and, and easy to sort of build your own first thing. And so there are absolutely places where rigor around naming, rigor around structure will save you from interfaces that are just utterly unassailable. The other piece is once you've gotten to a place where your application is now really more than one copy of an individual layer, right? So I have seven web machines, and I have 18 app machines, and I got a Brazilian DB machines. That summarization is something that's still not particularly good on our tools. Dashboards don't really summarize that stuff up very well. User interfaces don't summarize that stuff up very well. So you may end up in a situation where you end up having to supplement our views building some of your own reporting, some of your own analysis that reflects that kind of summarization. I think we'll continue to work on that stuff. I think that's a challenge for any system. Does it, the picture look good when it's right up against my face, and does it look good when I'm zoomed out a thousand times? That's the kind of challenge we're in. But it's certainly a place to keep paying attention to. We, we also, we have in our environment, uh, you know, you can certainly configure machines in a way in your own networks that are widely specced, right? So you could have, you know, uh, sort of the worst conceivable case. You could have like a four socket box, but then you buy the cheapest, dirtiest Xeons that there are with two cores a piece or something, but then you can slap in two terabytes or something of RAM, right? You could have these unbelievable RAM to compute ratios. We today re leave those relatively narrow, six and a half to one to one fifth to one or one half to one, sorry. So the narrowness of that, if you have very extreme RAM to compute ratios, those can make it so that you end up over-provisioning the processing that you need. In the same way, our network is bound to the compute that you consume. So you may be in an environment like, say, you're trying to run Redis or Memcached, where you're really looking at, I want a box with maximum memory, maximum network. You might have to bring a little extra CPU along on the ride to get our systems to give you the network throughput that you need. Now, we really over-provision network. We give you two gigabits a second per core. So you can have an eight-core VM with 16 gig a second networking. And that's not like 16 gigs of theoretical and then real world, you get like 11 and a half, and you're in there sort of trying to do MTU reconfiguration to figure out, no, it's 16. You can do the tests all day long. They work great. And you have a cluster of 100 of them. They'll all do 16. Right? It's very, very fast networking. But if you need quick networking, you're going to end up using at least sort of that eight core line to get there. And that's an important measure. That becomes interesting as we continue to add more raw materials to the virtual machines. Right? So today you have uh, what we call custom VMs. You can adjust how many cores and how much memory you need per VM. You, you want a 16 core, now forget that. You want an 18 core VM and you want 46.25 gigs of RAM. Awesome, we will sell you one of those. We'll charge you for only what you need. But you may also want SSD on there and you may also want GPU on there. We enable, and it's totally unique to Google Cloud, it's one of the things that I think is most powerful. We enable you to individually assign, I want mm, three 375 gig slices of SSD on this VM with 46.25 gigs of RAM, and I want four slots of K80 NVIDIA GPU. That's a, that's a monster virtual machine we just built up. But uh, because there are sort of limits in that scalability, you just got to sort of make sure that the ratios that you're using fit into what we document as a best practice. So that's critical. Um, 
we, we are also, this last one's funny, yes. You, you're, you will certainly end up you know, in relation to the first one, turning things off and having pe people squeal. I, I can also sort of say that um, some of the important places to, to pay attention to beyond this, you know, we're, we take very seriously, many of you may be, because you're here at the conference, your early customers, your aggressive customers. Google follows a very clear sequenced step of product releases. So we do a thing called early access that gives people access to applications before we think they're done. And that means that they can crash and burn and die and we change them and they do all sorts of terrible things. We have alpha products that we think of as probably done, but we are, we're way beyond being able to set an SLA or even understand probably what pricing will look like or be able to assert any kind of SLA. So alpha products, some of our customers get access to. Lots of our customers get access to beta products. Those we also typically keep the price points off of, and um, we're not willing to sign up for an SLA, but we think they're in a final state. We think that your code won't change when it moves to GA. We think that we've got the API code complete. So most of our customers, most of our developers feel very comfortable with beta software, an important sort of threshold in that, a way to anticipate the degree of confidence that you can have in beta to GA software is to look and see if that's a product that's been running at Google for a long time, right? So we've put uh, Cloud Spanner into beta. Now, Cloud Spanner powers every one of the systems at Google. So you have to imagine that it's not like we're building Spanner over again. What we're doing is we're adding an API layer that allows us to charge you for it. And I suspect that the operations around the API layer to charge you for it are nowhere near as complex as the cesium clocks and the GPS devices that are on the racks and all the crazy software that it takes to make soft, uh, Spanner work. So in our environments, we're seeing lots of customers build production systems on beta services. That may be different than you're used to in other environments. And so as you're going through, certainly interact with your customer engineer, get some of the context from your peers, reach out to the broader community to understand what they're seeing in performance and availability for the services that are in alpha and certainly in beta as you move forward. We are also very aggressive about moving to GA. We take GA very seriously. It's a very different threshold. We absolutely commit to SLAs on all products that are in GA. And so you'll see the top level of Google's support and service for those launches. That's why it's so exciting to hear that the ML engine product has now gone GA, because you can really start to look at businesses getting ready to deploy very, very massive machine learning systems on us and to be able to count on a very clear SLA. It's also important for folks that are building environments designed for availability, uh, not every SLA is the same. You should really look at what happens when those SLAs get breached, right? Same way as you should always try to restore your backups from time to time, right? Like, if the penalties associated with us failing an SLA or with our competitors failing their SLAs aren't toothy, aren't violent, you know, I want to make sure that you feel like your needs are managed and your needs are satisfied and that uh, having a contractual relationship with a provider that really binds us to shared fate to shared responsibility over ensuring that you're successful. That's, I think that's a critical part. We've turned that from a contractual thing and now we're actually doing it in practice. So, so one of my sister teams, customer reliability engineering, they'll come out and our practice with you is once you've gone through what we call a product reliability review, a PRR, we actually go through your application and say, nope, that's super lame, you shouldn't run it that way, and no, that's super broken, you shouldn't do that, and oh, that's gonna be difficult for you to maintain. If you pass the same checklist that Google applications pass, then we will share pagers with you. We'll take an SLA for your app, which is a pretty incredible thing. There are a couple of presentations about CRE I certainly rep recommend for the operations folks to take a look at that stuff because it's a really a totally different level of commitment from a cloud provider to folks running applications on top of us. So uh, simple closing haiku. I, you know, I think you probably moved to the cloud quick. It's going to be easier than you think. It's going to be super groovy. Thanks.